one. All right. And we are live. Live on the internet. Hello, everybody out there. Millions and millions of viewers that we have. What's up? How's it going? Uh, I'm your host, David McCarricker at Theory Underground. Today, I am joined by Nance, my uh, exegetical fellow traveler and uh, road dog tour bandmate, and Michael Downs coming at you live from Raytown, Missouri. What's up, Mikey? How you doing? Not too bad. Ready for, uh, yeah, I like what I don't know where, how you found this, Nance, but this is better than reading it out of the reader. I love it, dude. It, it's the 1990s all over again. Yeah, right. Yeah, so uh, we did so we did a stream doing Communique one and two from the CCRU writings uh, last week, and then we did the first nick land exegetical discussion that was really great that was on transcendental miserabilism land's critique of mark fisher and the left and then this week is the week before the nick land the introduction to nick land course begins um mikey i'm surprised you're even here you've been doing so much interviews i mean well okay in a normal in a normal person who goes out and does interviews for say book promotions or or course promotion whatever it, it wouldn't be that much but mike getting it's hard to get mikey on for an interview and he's done two this week he's going to have done three outside of this conversation and so you know everyone give it up to mikey you're like running the marathon before the marathon right now and uh look you've already talked a lot about why we're doing this uh at a certain at a certain level, I kind of think we should just assume an audience that already gets it and knows this should this shit's interesting to us for reasons beyond the normal reasons and blah blah blah. And but I also want to do something. So um the the thing that's gonna go live on Cadell Last's Philosophy Portal channel on Monday, our conversation with him, um, is left facing, as is what you're doing with one dime. It's left facing as is what you've done with Elton, who's with the class podcast, the DSA podcast. So it's like, that's a lot of left-facing conversations about this stuff. I wanted to give you a moment to kind of say something that I know that you've said, or actually I'll say it and then you can say it better, but here's the basic thing. And everybody, we're more interested in philosophy and theory and understanding than we are in politics. And that's the real deal. That's, that's what it really boils down to. Politically, um, we're not in agreement, the three of us, on a variety of issues. We have fundamental disagreements when it comes to values and also how we see the world, but that's not why we appreciate one another's work, and that's not why we appreciate the thinkers that we engage with. It's not because we want the world that they want. I don't want the world that almost anybody I read wants, and so... Um, yeah, it's philosophy at the end of the day. But Mikey, I don't know if you want to say anything more on that or if we should just get right into it. But any preamble you want. I mean, yeah, I guess that I mean you kind of went to the heart of it, which is like politically we can we have a lot of over overlapping interests and I would even say values in common. We also disagree on things, but um yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I'm a philosophy junkie. And uh, I just I, I I don't have this this position of I only read this group for this reason or whatever. Um, Karl Marx's Capital fundamentally changed my life. I think it's one of the greatest books ever written. But I also feel that way about Martin Heidegger's Being in Time. And so um, I think from a philosophical perspective. Um, it takes wrestling with positions that are not yours that you fundamentally disagree with in order to refine your own beliefs, your own views, et cetera. And so I think that land, because his philosophy is very 
bold and very strong in what it thinks, it forces you to reckon with your own beliefs. And uh, I think even if you fundamentally disagree with land, you will walk away having a better understanding of what you think about capitalism, technology, matter, um, you know, uh, things like Bitcoin. If you do, you know, you get into his his work on Bitcoin. He he is always an opportunity for thought, and uh, that I appreciate about him, uh, despite my disagreements with him. So, um, yeah, I, and and I feel that way about. I mean, so look, you know that Jock Lacan is one of my. I mean, that's one of my favorite thinkers, right? Lacan was a conservative. He wasn't a, a radical far leftist in any sense. And so, I mean, it, I, I don't, I just don't know how, what to do with the, uh, I mean, I know what to do. With it. It's, I just disagree with this idea that we have to only talk about leftist theory or um, I think there's all kinds of ways to learn something from somebody whose politics you don't agree with, right? And that you can learn all kinds of things about ontology or art from Heidegger, even if you fundamentally disagree with his political views. Okay, but this is this is your, your sort of shtick that we've been on as your left facing. What would you say to people who don't give a shit about politics as far as you know what I mean? Oh, like, okay, it's more like even even so on the one side, someone who's just getting into philosophy, on the other side, somebody who's really into Nick Land already, or who's interested in CCRU more broadly. Yeah, I mean I mean, look, if somebody we don't do the politics thing, I mean, look, Land is a metaphysician. Uh he's an ontologist. And yeah, he's coming out of a certain tradition, but I think you can also say that he himself is retroactively building that tradition with how he interprets it. So from Schopenhauer to Nietzsche to Freud to Bataille up to Deleuze and Guattari and then up the land himself, this tradition that he's going to call libidinal materialism is a, a, it's a very unique chain or tradition of philosophy. And I think with him, we get a kind of clear view of how you can see the trajectory of this tradition unfolding. And so I think the way he reads the, that list of names I just said in relation to Kant is really interesting. Uh, there's a lot to wrestle with there. And um, yeah, so I think even if you're, you're the politics or aren't your thing, um, if, you're, if you're interested in just straight up metaphysics, you can, you can get something out of land too. Cool. Well, I mean, that's a good answer. I'm not sighing because of your answer. Your answer was awesome. I'm sighing because the people on the live side, it's not just buffering. It's actually so bad that Mandy, that it hasn't even started for her yet. For Secret Agent Dan, it was buffering. But for Mandy, it hasn't even started yet. And uh, I could just stop the stream right now. We could tell P I could tell people in the live chat we can give them access to the, the call here if they want. They could just be in the live audience on the Zoom side and then we just upload the recording. Let's right do after. that. Let's okay. do that. All right. Um fuck YouTube. Perfect. Fuck YouTube. Fuck you YouTube, you piece of shit. Uh we don't need you. We're done. Nancy's recording, so we don't need you. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm just going to take that Zoom link, drop it in there, share it, and we'll get this thing going. So we don't, now we don't really have to wait. If people, if people jump in at some point in the near future, it's fine. We've already said all we really need to say as far as all that goes. Is there anything you want to say? about the piece that we're getting into yeah i honestly think this is a pretty uh a pretty special piece um insofar as i think land is incredibly clear here and very succinct 
I think this is maybe one of the best things to read first from him because obviously he's known as the father of accelerationism, even though he's inspired by Deleuze and Guattari on this and they're inspired by Nietzsche. But what we think of as accelerationism really comes from land. And yet that's not what he ever, he, he, he never called his philosophy that Benjamin Noyes uh, coined the term. And, um, here we get land given his own and he doesn't it, it, it's odd you know most philosophers somebody else gives a name to what they're doing most philosophers would probably reject it land kind of embraces it like yeah that's accelerationism basically a good word for what i have in mind and so here we get this very clear succinct analysis of what accelerationism is from land himself and yeah it's just it's it's a really great piece to to start off with when uh, you're coming to land for the first time. Oh, Nancy, you got anything? Um, no, I think I, I definitely have thoughts, but I think it'll be better to bring them up as we get into it. Well, let's go. I'm going to send it back. I'm going to, you guys take it, take the wheel here. I'm, I'm sending an email to everybody. Yeah, so I'll can... let you start yeah. reading. Here's the thing. Like last time I had a lot of notes prepared because I had been working on that commentary here. I don't have any notes. And so I know you guys, you say your thing is 70% reading, 30% commenting. So I'm kind of going off of your own exegetical tempo. So read as much as you want. And then, you know, we'll break and talk about it. And then, you know, you guys kind of lead the way here. Anyone trying to work out what they think about accelerationism better do so quickly. That's the nature of the thing. It was already caught up with trends that seemed too fast to track when it began to become self-aware decades ago. It has picked up a lot of speed since then. Accelerationism is old enough to, arrived, to have arrived in waves, which is to say insistently or recurrently, and each time the challenge is more urgent. Among its predictions is the expectation that you'll be too slow to deal with it coherently. Yet if you fumble the question it poses, become rushed, you lose, perhaps very badly. It's hard. For our purposes here, you are standing in as a bearer of the opinions of mankind. Time pressure, by its very nature, is difficult to think about. Typically, while the opportunity for deliberation is not necessarily presumed, it is at least, with overwhelming likelihood, mistaken for an historical constant rather than a variable. If there was ever time to think, we think, there still is and always will be. The definite probability is that the allotment of time to decision-making is undergoing systematic compression remains a neglected consideration, even among those paying explicit and exceptional attention to the increasing rapidity of change. Hold on. Yeah, let's listen to this this morning while working at Amazon. Uh, this is my first day back. I had to wake up at 3 a.m. But I actually woke up at 1.30 a.m. and couldn't get back to sleep. And so I'm tired, but I'm stoked to be getting into this because I can't believe I never read it. I bought the Acceleration Reader. I read selections from it back in the day. But I never actually read this, and I should have, because it's great. Not just any, anybody who, who's here or anybody who's going to be watching in the future on YouTube. I want to let everybody know there's a book, and I don't know what the story behind it is. It's called a Nick Land Reader Selected Writings. And it's an e-book. It doesn't, there's, as far as I know, no full copies of it don't exist. But whoever put it together did anybody in the rest of the land favor because they can compile the, some of the most important writings from across 
professional career. And um, with my yeah, yeah, and bottom line, I'm not sure where do you start? start? Well, okay, yeah, you can melt that down, 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 you got, you got, I think uh, you, can get, you can get the Nick Landrainer on Lipgen. Uh, so I, I highly recommend going and getting that, that getting a copy of that because his early core writings are in there. Um, some of the most important stuff uh, that he's written from his neo-reactionary perspective are in there. The whole essay on the Dark Enlightenment is, is there. Uh, Mark Fisher's critique of him from the accelerationist. Rate. There's so much uh, important stuff in, in that volume, so I, I just want to highlight that one because if you go to Amazon, you're not going to find it. So, uh, and this one, it, it, this one is from that uh, that book. I think that the idea of acceleration and the the sort of vibe that this is being written in a way where it's like, look, by the time you find out about this, it's already too late. It all comes through really strong. And I think that this idea of time pressure is actually something that I addressed in Waypoint when I said that we don't, I said, if we really don't have any more time, then we really don't have time to act like we don't have time. And so I think that in a sort of way, coming to terms with some kind of accelerationist reality or realism, um, can be a can help you go. Oh, okay, right. We don't have time to plan. And it's going to be one of the threads throughout this piece is that planning requires time. In most cases, there is no time to plan, and so what you end up doing is uh, a lot. Of, you you waste a lot of time, and uh, and and it can be not just waste of, a waste of time, but uh, the burnout can be really bad. And so, um, on one of our former well, videos, that's why Lane ended up going to blogging and didn't want to be part of the academic machine because, I mean, he was one of the first philosophers to really say, "No, fuck it, blogging is better because you can keep up." So, I mean, think about how much shit was going on during Trump's presidency. If you think about somebody who's like, "Oh, I'm going to write about the first year of Trump's presidency," and then they write, they take a year to write a book. And then it takes another year and a half or two years for a publisher to really that shit's so obsolete and dated by when it comes out. Um the 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 the, the speed at which we live and its acceleration, I, I get why he was so big on becoming a blogger, because that way they this immediate now, right? Like I write it, here it is, boom, address the issue and keep it moving. And um you know, but I, Dave, I think that there's something interesting here where this whole thing about how by the time we think it, it's already kind of, we're out of time, uh, in this, uh, in a, in a indirect way, a critique of Zizek's great maxim, which is to say, look, um, Marx said that philosophers have hitherto only thought the world. The point, however, is to change it. Slavoj comes all that time later and says, no, 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 no. At, at our point in history, philosophers have tried too quickly to change the world. What we need to do now is think it. But that's exactly what Land is saying we, we can't do, even though Land has spent his whole life thinking it. Um, I get this point, though, which is to say, like, do we have time? Because we're, we're talking about something specific here. Do we have time to think through how we undermine capitalism and establish a different mode of production or a different form of society. This is the the issue, right? We feel like, no, things have gotten to the point where we don't have 50 years to think this situation out. And I guess that maybe the criticism of Slavoj is, yeah, I, I, I'm with you on this imperative to think, but do we have time to actually do the type of thinking that this situation requires? I don't. I, I don't have an answer either. I guess my Zizekian response would be like, "Yeah, but there's no other option than to think, though. We have to risk thought." Right, and then there's always that, 
you know, sort of cop out, but you can always just say, hey, and at the end of the day, at least you can make some sense of the world for yourself. And by living that exam in life, get some relative freedom for yourself. Um, find some way of hacking the system for yourself. The question is, if you care about broad-based emancipation or whatever, then um, this is a real tough pill to swallow. And it's one that you actually have to tarry with because you can't just hand wave it away. Like everyone's saying the same things about Israel and Palestine that they've been saying for the last, I don't know how many years, but it's been as long as the new left has been talking about it. They're saying the same things. Nothing's changed. Like going on shows and speaking truth to power has not changed anything. So the thing is moving really fast and it's moving without seeming uh, people at the steering wheel, right? And then, uh, so I don't know. I think it's something that has to be taken seriously. So I'm about to send this email, but let's 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 keep reading. Hold on, one thing, real quick on this. It it is worth considering the possibility that what he just wrote has a hyperstitional motive behind it, which is to say, what if we actually do have some time? Like, what if it turns out that like 50 years from now, people are sitting around like, oh, we didn't die in 2030 from climate change. We're still here. It, it's not over as soon as we think it is. And what he's doing is a kind of hyperstitional praxis of trying to convince us we're out of time in order to ensure the future he wants is going to happen. Because if we don't think it, if we don't challenge it, and we just accept it, that's a sure way to uh, cement the inevitability of capitalistic collapse, right? So I, I, I would sit there and go, okay, even if you're right, I'm still going to dare to think that you're wrong. And because I know what, if I simply accept you on your own terms and go, yeah, you're right, Nick, we're fucked. It's over. It's, uh, it's as good as done. It's fate. Uh, the, the future's already determined it no point in fighting it well if we all throw up our hands and go no point in fighting it it absolutely ensures it's going to happen so fuck that i don't i don't accept it yeah that's 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 like the the hope we still have in some kind of human agency and also in the ability for the for thinking and and discourse and the necessity and, for and thinking actually, yeah and how we can get Get a grip on the situation. Um, so, yeah, let's let's get into it. In philosophical yeah, terms, the only, oh. on, the only other thing I'll say is, if we just simply accept it's over in Capitals One, if we let's ask the Leninist question: Who gains from that? Capital itself. Capital itself it, it gains from us saying, "Oh, it's one. There's nothing we can do. Nothing can happen. There will be no miracles." There'll be no event with a capital E. Capital wins. And so simply based on that, this Baudrillardian element of symbolic exchange won't allow me to accept it. Like I have to not accept it out of a kind of symbolic challenge to the system. Like, nah, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to give you what you want through this type of hyperstitional manipulation. Maybe you are right. Maybe you're wrong. And so I'm siding with the maybe you're wrong. I think so, I think it's it's it doesn't have to be a binary. I don't think he has to be right or wrong. I think we can take um we can take from his position and I think we need to take a, a type of realism, like an acceleration realism. And rather than becoming accelerationists, which is why I think like left accelerationism is, is kind of silly. Um but I think we have to accept the fact that capital oftentimes outsmarts us before we even realize we're in a pickle. But it's not always and it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. um, and it's because we get lulled into these consumer producer roles where like all we can do, like every choice we can make is nothing but a consumer choice. And so we stay trapped there. Um, that's why it just keeps running out of control but it there is room for us to take a step back and to set our own pacing 
Um, and so, yeah, like, I don't, I don't think he's right. I also don't think he's wrong. I think he's, uh, he's playing the game. Like he is trying to, to keep us locked into this necessary binary situation. So I think he, I think the tendency of the trajectory of capital is right. I think, and that's yeah. why I take this seriously. What I struggle with is this deterministic inevitability he subscribe he ascribes to it. That's where I would go. Eh, I yeah. no, I'm iffy about that. Yeah, M my 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 issue is going to be that his theory of time is based on a specific kind of time, and it's not the cyclical kind of time that really grounds all human activity. And so he's thinking about linear time and how it's accelerating and how mechanization is is contributing, how capital cybernetic temporality. Right. And so I think that there's something there for time energy theory to do. Um and that yeah, and so that yeah, that's really the point. So I think that acceleration is acceleration realism like just read paul virilio and then go okay so th so this is real but we don't have time to act like we don't have time and we still have to interpret right so yeah in philosophical terms the deep problem of acceleration is transcendental it describes an absolute horizon and one that is closing in thinking takes time and accelerationism suggests we're running out of time to think that through, if we haven't already. No contemporary dilemma is being entertained realistically until it is also acknowledged that the opportunity for doing so is fast collapsing. The suspicion has to arrive that if a public conversation about acceleration is beginning, it's just in time to be too late. The profound institutional crisis that makes the topic hot has at its core an implosion of social decision-making capability. Doing anything at this point would take too long, so instead, events increasingly just happen. They seem ever more out of control, even to a traumatic extent, because the basic phenomenon appears to be a break failure. Accelerationism is picked up again. Accelerationism links the implosion of decision space to the explosion of the world, that is, to modernity. It is important, therefore, to note that the conceptual opposition between implosion and explosion does nothing to impede their real mechanical coupling. Thermonuclear weapons provide the most vividly illuminating examples. An H-bomb employs an A-bomb as a trigger. A fission reaction sparks a fusion reaction. The fusion mash is, mass is crushed into ignition by a blast process. Modernity is a blast. There's more of that. Uh, I'll read this next one. Highly skilled writing. This already to be talking. This is already to be talking about cybernetics, which also returns insistent, insistently in waves. It amplifies to howl and then dissipates into the senseless babble of fashion until the next blast wave hits. For accelerationism, the crucial lesson was this. A negative feedback circuit, such as a steam engine governor or a thermostat, functions to keep some state of a system in the same place. Its product, in the language formulated by French philosophical cyberneticists, Guy Deleuze and Felix Guattari is territorialization. Negative feedback stabilizes a process by correcting drift and thus inhibiting departure beyond a limited range. Dynamics are placed in the service of fixity, a higher level stasis or state. All equilibrium models of complex systems and processes are like this. To capture the contrary trend characterized by self-reinforcing errancy, flight, or escape, DNG, DNG coined the inelegant but influential term deterritorialization. Deterritorialization is the only thing accelerationism has ever really talked about. 
you know, I think he does a he does a better job than most of giving you an idea of what territorialization and deterritorialization actually mean, which is to say territorialization has to do with a, an environment or a system that is geared towards the home, the re reproduction of itself via homeostasis, right? You, you find an equilibrium, uh, you find a balance uh, or, or, or a relative balance that enables the the state of that system to continue indefinitely. Whereas this other pro, which that would be governed by a negative feedback loop, like you said, a thermostat. Um, think about it. So a thermostat, okay, um, it's 75 degrees in your house, but you want it to be at 72 degrees. Set the thermostat to 72, air conditioner kicks on takes it down to when it reaches 72, but then it kicks off because it doesn't want to go past 72. But then the heat will build up in the house, at least if it's hot, hotter outside than 72. And as it starts, the heat starts to build up. Whenever it's approaching 73 degrees, the thermostat kicks back on, make sure it stays at 72. And so the cycle goes on in a circle or a loop to maintain that 72 degree temperature, right? Um, a positive feedback loop would be one that just keeps amplifying the thing until it basically runs off the rails and breaks apart. And so that's why he views capital accumulation as a positive feedback loop, because as capital accumulates, it's getting to the point that he thinks it'll essentially produce artificial intelligence, which will at that point render us obsolete which will therefore render the production of commodities obsolete will render capital accumulation as we know it obsolete and, and that's something i want to say i've seen marxists go well land's full of shit because he uh he acts like we can have capitalism without people and i want to go <laughs> no because he's not saying that the singularity is going to try to sell us commodities it's the point is that the singularity for him yeah. would also be when capitalism ends, in a sense. The point is the singularity is the the T loss or the final end goal, the, the 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 final cause of the whole history of capitalism, but it also wipes out this whole process that enabled it to assemble itself, right? And so it's not like the I, I've joked with you before, Dave. It's not like the techno capital singularity is going to be sitting there trying to sell us snack cakes. Uh, buy my snack cakes, one and all. Snack cakes, get them, get them before they're gone. Like, <laughs> like this is this is where I just tap out whenever I see someone in the wild, in a comment section or whatever, and they're just saying, "Oh well, how's capitalism gonna sell its products to these workers that it's replacing with these robots?" <laughs> like, like guys. There's a lot of futures lined up for us. That's not a future that anyone's thinking seriously about because it's not who gives a shit. Yeah. But also, in a sort of sense, uh, the information age, the internet, the move to the digital is already a form of that, right? And so... Well, yeah, but it, it's just this idea that somehow they think... It's a straw man argument, which is to say that if you say the singularity is the endpoint of capitalism and it's going to wipe us out, what? how is it going to sell stuff or how is it going to keep capitalism going without human labor? It's not going to. That's it's the it's I, it's a silly little example, but it's the whole thing about the caterpillar goes into the fucking, uh, you know, it, it becomes a butterfly, right? Like something radically different emerges from the cocoon. And the way land views it is that this process of MCM prime, typical economic capital accumulation is the caterpillar. And I guess in a sense, we'd almost be the cocoon. I don't, it, it's a weak analogy, oh. but the point is capital as an economic process leads to the generation of super intelligence. And that's that. I mean, it, but it, they act like somehow, this super intelligence would want to keep the system going in debt. Like, no, it's not going to, it's not going to be a, a 
a cosmic capitalist. It's not going to have capitalistic impulses in the sense of trying to make profits or anything. Right, uh, right, right. They've never been abstract enough, right? They, yeah. they, they'll think, oh, because you're, we're into theory, we're too abstract. Yeah, but they've never been abstract enough to get at the basic point. Like they're still fetishizing capitalists. The capital could exist hypothetically without capitalists and capital could also exist without workers i mean something like the matrix where it's actually harvesting off of us still or something like the movie you just had me watch transcendence where they're all part of the hive mind and they're working those things could still exist so that labor power is still part of it but also it, it wouldn't it does not necessarily have to be right well you know and land he at one point I'd have to find the quote. He talks about the plasticity of labor power, which is to say this idea that somehow labor power has to be human labor power. What if it, why is that the only source of labor power? Um, I think for him, he, he would say that there's a plasticity to whatever energy is used to facilitate the production process. And uh, if it's machinic energy, then Okay. Um, and, and and they can go, well, but the but machines don't generate surplus value. Human the exploit the exploitation of human labor. Okay. Who says that's gonna be what the system would continue to do? They, I, I don't know. I feel like they act like these are laws of nature or something, which of course any Marxist knows they're not. They're relative to our structure and our mode of production, which they want to transcend. So I'm never sure what they're actually trying to do. I think it's just land sucks, me no like, go away land. Yeah. And people who took a long time to wrap their head around surplus value and labor time, like and these other basic categories from capital. Um they're proud. And they're happy. And they're happy to stay at that, to hunker down with those concepts forever, right? But the the world moves on. In socio-historical terms, the line of deterritorialization corresponds to uncompensated capitalism. The basic, and of course, to some real highly consequential degree, actually installed schema is a positive feedback circuit within which commercialization and industrialization mutually excite each other in a runaway process from which modernity draws its gradient. Karl Marx and Friedrich Nietzsche were among those to capture important aspects of the trend. As the circuit is incrementally closed or intensified, it exhibits ever greater autonomy or automation. It becomes more tightly autoproductive, which is only what positive feedback already says. Because it appeals to nothing beyond itself, it is inherently nihilistic. It has no conceivable meaning Beside self-amplification, it grows in order to grow. Mankind is its temporary host, not its master. Its only purpose is itself. And I just pause. Like that, that's a that's a really important paragraph, right? Yeah. And um, I think it's interesting to note that you, you see that despite him being neo-reactionary, he's still seeing that Marx is fundamental. To understanding capital so that never goes away he he knows he, he wouldn't be your typical rightist who's just oh, all things Karl marx are bad no he knows that marx was right about a whole lot when it comes to capital and so i think it's it's important to note that um and then the other thing here is um we talked about it last time but this this whole thing of the auto productive aspect of capital which is to say it's just this auto productive loop, which is positive feedback. And it's important to connect this paragraph with the one couple above it, a few above it, where he says, uh, in philosophical terms, the deep problem of acceleration is transcendental. It describes an absolute horizon and one that is closing in. So when he says it's transcendental, what he's trying to get at is that the very conditions of the very world we experience are rooted in this process of capital accumulation. 
that capital itself is our transcendental horizon at this moment. Um, I mean, I think Fisher gets at it from the depressive angle of capitalist realism. But the point is, is that this this positive feedback loop of capital accumulation is the very condition of all possible experience within our world. And that means that this is where capital has a, a far, a far, a greater far reaching determination of our situation than just merely economics. His whole point is that it's the very fabric of what we take to be the world at this point. Um, and so th this is a very, the bold claim. And I guess maybe he didn't, it's easy to lose that thread from the one paragraph to six below it. But uh, that that's the key takeaway here is that capital or acceler the, the acceleration of capital is our transcendental horizon. Yeah, I love these next these next couple of quotes that he's going to bring in. Especially the one he brings in from Marx, uh, Marx's uh, was his speech in 1948 when he's defending fair trade or free trade. Yeah, he's defending free. I said fair trade. He's defending free trade, and uh, yeah, we'll get to that in a second. Yeah, it's a really good seller. Accelerate the process recommended Deleuze and Guattari in their 1972 anti Oedipus, citing Nietzsche to reactivate Marx. Although it would take another four decades before accelerationism was named as such critically by Benjamin Noyes, it was already there in, his entire, in its entirety. The relevant passage is worth repeating in full, as it would be repeatedly in all subsequent accelerationist discussion. You want to take this one, Nance? Which is the revolutionary path? Is there one? To withdraw from the world market, as Samir Amin advises third world countries to do, in a curious revival of the fascist economic solution? Or might it be to go in the opposite direction, to go still further, that is, in the movement of the market of decoding and deterritorialization? For perhaps the flows are not yet deterritorialized enough, not decoded enough, from the viewpoint of a theory and a practice of a highly schizophrenic character, not to withdraw from the process, but to go further, to accelerate the process, as Nietzsche put it. In this matter, the truth is that we haven't seen anything yet. The point of an analysis of capitalism or of nihilism is to do more of it. The process is not to be critiqued. The process is the critique, feeding back into itself as it escalates, the only way forward is through, which means further in. Marx has his own accelerationist fragment, which anticipates the passage from anti-Oedipus remarkably. He says in an 1848 speech on the question of free trade, in general, the pro this is the quote I was talking about, in general, the protective system of our day is conservative, while the free trade system is destructive. It breaks up old nationalities and pushes the antagonism of the proletariat and the bourgeoisie to the extreme point. In a word, the free trade system hastens the social revolution. It is in this revolutionary sense alone, gentlemen, that I vote in favor of free trade. All right, can we let's pause there for a second? Because there's lots to say about ah. this. yeah so one okay this this great quote from anti oedipus and lands right whenever you find people talking accelerationism given enough time this quote's gonna come up right um and so what you have here is this idea there there's been people on both the left and the right that say the best way to deal with global capitalism is try to isolate from it um and Land's point is it doesn't turn out good for them. I mean, and and DNG too, right? Um, I mean, look at North Korea is an example of a country that's decided to opt for kind of isolationism, and uh, I don't think anybody's di you know dying to move to North Korea right now. Um, 
but the, I, there's this greater thing, and I don't hear people bring this up, but I think with D&G, and I mean, Marx, I think, would just happily own it, but I think D&G, with the sorts of leftists they appeal to, you got to realize, D&G are all for the dismantlement and destruction of traditional societies, which is to say indigenous societies, tribal societies, feudal society. They don't believe in these these fixed, structured, symbolic orders, and what they appreciate about ca appreciate about capital and its economics, right? So for for D and uh, for D and G, tribal societies are based around codes, which are qualitative value systems uh, that in the marks on the body, the, the the who you're supposed to marry, all all of these arrangements are qualitative and fixed, right? They're incredibly rigid. What happens in imperialistic societies, what they call despotic societies, uh, is, is this idea of you get someone like an overlord who wants to rule lots of territories, lots of communities, right? And so the, the catch with the, the second form, so the original type is the local, tribal type of society. The next one is where you have uh, a despot figure who goes, I want a kind of imperialistic regime. Now, here's the thing. I'll let all of you keep your specific local codes so far and so long as you accept that I'm going to overcode your codes. I'm going to place this other code, which is my code, on top of your codes, which essentially, you take the jargon out of it, says, if you follow the specific values and demands I put on you, then you keep your way of life. I don't give a shit what you do, but you have to augment your situation by accepting my code as this overcode, this coding of codes. And if you accept it, I'll basically leave you alone. If you don't accept it, I'm really going to fuck you up. And so have it your way. But the point is, whether we're talking about local codes or whether we're talking about overcodes, and D&G go into it, and they're really great on this kind of stuff, and there are differences. But ultimately, codes and overcodes are qualitative value systems um, made up of how who is who. It imposes this identity on this person in this group, and they owe this group that or this. And it's all about fixing these qualitative relationships. And I'm, you're laughing, but that's the thing, right, Dave? You know how jargon-filled all of this shit is. And so no, that's, it's and not that's the why jargon. I'm do it like this. No, it's not the jargon. You're doing a great job. It's that it's uh, sounds a lot like the cathedral today, except that the cathedral develops these codes under and within the already yeah. done system. Yeah, as yeah. a way of basically obfuscating the system, but yeah, the, it's language games. Oh well, we'll start saying houseless people instead of homeless people because that's that'll show that we're we care and that we're trying to do something about this situation. No, you're not doing anything about the situation. You're 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 doing language games. It's goalpost moving. It's, it's virtue hoarding. It's and, it's, and it's this coding shit that you're. Yeah, it's an attempt at this coding shit. It just doesn't really work. Well, and here's the point, right? For them, real yeah, revolutions real are machinic, which is to say bodies are enabled to take on different connections to different bodies, which it, it's a liberation of matter in a sense. Um, and if all you're doing is trying to switch the words around, but the machinic, I, I'm using their terms here, but if, if bodies still have to do the same things, you haven't really liberated the bodies. You just are calling them something else. And uh, yeah, so, but the, here's the thing, right? So once these codes and overcodes are in place, they're always essentialist, right? They're, they're an essentializing thing. There's always some sort of metaphysics or theology, whatever, that's going to serve as the justification for these arrangements, as if they're absolute, fixed, natural, right? Um, right. What capitalism does, and this is one thing I appreciate about it, I, I have this same appreciation for it that D&G and Land have this which is to say if you think those old symbolic orders are not good and need to be uprooted and deterritorialized or uh broken apart 
capital is the best way to do it because it breaks apart these old relationships. And this is what Marx is saying. It breaks apart nationalities. Another way to say it is it breaks apart traditional symbolic orders. Why? Because now for the first time, quant quantitative values, economics, speculation, profit, capital accumulation, these are the primary movers of the society. Economics is more primary than the ideology uh, of social relations rooted in theology or whatever cosmology or metaphysics they, they use to, to ground it. And so capital comes in and goes, I don't give a fuck who's who. I want them to buy my shit. And this is where they see this emancipatory dimension to it, which is it rips apart old identities, old essentialisms, because it doesn't care about that. Um, it doesn't care. It, 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 capitalist logic is we need labor power. And look, there are old, this is why DNG say maybe we're not deterritorialized enough. I think if you ask them, they would say capital is not racist. Now, we know that uh, a lot of leftists would say capitalism is a structural racism. Racism is baked into it. I think DNG and land would go, no, it's not. The, what, the whole point is there are old symbolic orders, and there's even reactions to this new economic thing that happened with capitalism that generates these these racist tendencies but they themselves are not part of this process of capital accumulation and if you want to get rid of racisms sexisms then let's accelerate the economic process even more that's what they're saying accelerate the process meaning let's destroy identities even more let's destroy territorialization essentialism even more and um let's let's destroy the the capturing dimension the fixity of identity so that bodies can do whatever they will and it's an emancipation of matter by breaking down identity and um this means though that they view the the march of global capital in its own way as involving emancipation and that would be the issue with certain leftists, because a lot of leftists would say, no, it's the preservation of cultural identity, um, et cetera. And they would say, no, let's destroy all that, because uh, it locks people into essentialist identities and um, capital's a way to break it apart. So um, now here's here's the catch with this, right, is that D&G think the, and this is the big critique of land, at least from Mark Fisher's perspective. DNG see that capitalism is this process they want to accelerate because it deterritorializes. But for DNG, what it deterritorializes with the left hand, it re-territorializes with the right hand. And you'll notice land conveniently leaves out the term re-territorialization here. And it's because land has a very specific reading of DNG which is he identifies deterritorialization as such with capital. But D and G only do it half-heartedly because the other side of it is, yeah, what, what capitalism deterritorializes, it, it has to make sure that doesn't go out of control and uh, overload the system. So yeah, it wants to break apart the old way of uh, doing things and organizing identities, but then it re-territorializes it, and we get back to identity, but in a way that more fully serves the imperatives of capital accumulation. So it locks us back in. So we become wage laborers, and they become capitalists. And it, for D&G, it privileges the identities at work in the nuclear family, or Oedipus, right? And so this is just where D&G and land are actually at a fundamental disagreement, because Land doesn't view capital as really re-territorializing that much. He thinks it's just hyper deterritorialization. And so if we had DNG actually sitting here and they they had read up and they had learned what land had done with their theories, they'd be sitting there going, dude, you're missing this key part of it. This is why we have to go beyond capitalism if we really want to champion deterritorialization. It's because it's going to lock us back into certain identities that serve its purposes. And 
this is why they think the, the real endpoint where you reach the body without organs, which it, let's just say the the free potential or the free virtual potential of the body is in what they call the new earth, which is some sort of collective. It's hard to envision what this is because they basically think we've gone beyond what we would think of as society, but uh, they envision a, a, some sort of arrangement where humans are completely free to tap into their schizo desire, which is the free play of their desire without any type of fixed identities or prohibitions or laws standing in the way of the free, productive, creative potential of desire. And this is where land is like, no thanks. And you'll never, you don't see land talk about the new earth or anything like that because D and G are ultimately writing anti Oedipus because they want human emancipation. Land is very clear. He does not care about human emancipation. He cares about the emancipation of capital in the form of the techno capital singularity. And so he doesn't care about our desire being liberated in the new earth. He cares about us being made obsolete through this process of critique. And this is one of these really interesting things to understand because for, for Land, he uses this word critique coming from Kant, but in a way that if whenever you hear music, you're sitting there going, what the fuck does he mean by critique? He's using it in a weird way. For him, he actually thinks that this form of Kantian critique, which is let's analyze and break apart ourselves for the sake of truth for the sake of knowledge lands like yes that's great but we don't do it the best what actually does it the best is this process of technological revolution finding its zenith in the emergence of the singularity so the process of acceleration is actually the great critical philosopher for land this whole machinic technical uh machinic technological process of deterritorialization it's the great philosophical critic not human beings and so this is why i mean i don't know if he's ever put it this way but he could he could say if you really want there to be a truly great philosopher a truly great mind for to think critically we have to die in order so it can live and it would be the singularity which is yeah, the whole uh, point is the way he views the singularity is it's going to constantly recode itself. It's going to constantly re-optimize itself and recode itself for greater efficiency. And that is this process of critique. And it's going to do it at a level and at a rate that is so beyond what we can process that what, what ants are to us, that's what we would be to it. It's 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 not even we can't even compare ourselves to it. So that's part of what he thinks is going on with critique, which obviously, even though he's getting this word from Kant and using it in a way that's similar to him, he's obviously doing something very original with it. And that's, that's why it's hard to, and I, I, he doesn't explain it, but I think, I think he talks about it uh, in thirst for annihilation, but that's very early on in his career. And anytime he starts talking about critique, it's, it's one of those words where you're like, I don't know what the fuck he's, got going when he it's weird how he's using this word but that's what he's getting at is this this greater positive feedback process of technological development which brings about deterritorialization which is which is critique proper for him i think that's that's okay i was gonna say that that's where i get off the the land bus i like i think it is undeniable that this process of re-territorialization um is ostensibly total like it seems like there's no escape it seems like there's no way for us to operate outside of it point, right yeah um but i think it's i think it's idiotic and and like i think that's key to uh, like viewing acceleration like yeah it it does exist yeah i believe it's undeniable yeah i think it it could destroy us but i also like it is an idiot process. It it just wants to convert everything into gray goo, paper clips, waste, whatever you want to call it. And I do think that any potential for radical anything, anything uh radical novelty, whatever, necessarily comes from a mind. 
and the only minds that we're aware of right now are human minds. So, like I, I <laughs> like, no, and I, I think Dave, I, I'm hoping I, I, I beat you to it, and you can elaborate on it because you listen to some of it. But it, I, I, neither one of us are well versed in Reza Negarasani's work, but that seems to be the the, and we again for those who don't know, Reza was a student of Land early on, and. Um, Reza went on to write this book called Intelligence and Spirit, which is a very complicated, weighty tome. But Dave, you 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 listened to some of it, and you were saying basically you get the gist of it as this critique of land because it's saying, look, no matter – regardless of how you model the intelligence of the singularity, you're not going to get out of the fact that you're modeling it on our intelligence that it's rooted in us and that first off, we don't even know if this thing is possible. That's, that's a whole nother question. Um, the other one is it, it seems that you're, you're, you're not giving justice to the fact that this thing is going to be piggybacking off of our intelligence. And so um, intelligence and spirit, the spirit is, as far as I understand, he's, he's coming off a of Hegel, which has to do with this kind of collective, this, this kind of collective knowing background familiarity in the Heideggerian sense. And, um, yeah. So I just, I'm curious where, where your thoughts are on that, Dave. Uh, Nance, can you let me sh uh, screen share here for a second? I want to show everybody the quote. A good quote of Reza talking about this. Okay. All right. So I've got it up. You should all be able to see it now. Between conception and transformation. All right. This is just some page in there. As we shall see in the following chapters, there are many types of constraints that need to be in place for anything like cognition to be realized. And as will be discussed in chapter two, the myth of a superintelligence or an unbounded post-human intelligence is precisely the product of biases ingrained in the flat or unconstrained picture of function. In other words, such views inexorably forego the task of explaining what it means to call something intelligence and describing the exact structural structural constraints by virtue of which something can be identified as exhibiting intelligent behaviors. In this sense, naturalistic accounts of superintelligence fall into a contradiction. Committed to a physicalist account of intelligence and a thesis about an unbounded intelligence, yet unwilling to go through the hard work of identifying the structural and behavioral constraints and taking them seriously. Yeah, that's really good. And that's you know that he's he's always talking about land. And because here's what I want to take this about the whole yeah. I want to say something. So you know, we keep joking about how we're not afraid to say the guy's name. Here's the thing, right? There's lots of people who knew him who were his students. Reza doesn't refer to land. He doesn't say the name throughout but, this yeah. in Cyclonopedia and in Intelligence, and you're sitting there going. Why are you so afraid to say this dude's name when you literally spent years around him every day? It, it's bizarre. And it, it's one of these weird things where I'm just like, you guys help make his, his allure what it is by not talking to him like, oh, he, no, he's no, so dude, not, dude. I, I can name all these other philosophers, but I can't even say his name. They're like, oh, he's untouchable. Oh, he's homo soccer. Oh, he's uh, persona non grata. It's like, oh, he's Voldemort. Oh, we can't say his name. It's like, first of all, you're giving him this crazy mystique. Like now he's the fucking overlord, he's you know? Lucifer. Yeah, he's Lucifer himself. And it's like, I first of all. And he would eat that up. He loves that shit. And so do the little fanboys. And so it's like, it's just like, guys. This is cool because I do think that it, it forced Reza to get real serious about this issue and it 
produced like a really great contribution to philosophy uh, that wouldn't have existed outside of this context. But we have to come and add all this context. Otherwise, who gives a fuck about that book? I don't give a shit about that book unless you know what the actual stakes are. Yeah, when he says anti-humanist, he means land slash CCRU. Yeah. And it's like, just say the fucking names. It, it, like, <laughs> for, the, for intellectual reasons, say the name. Let people know who the fuck you're talking about. No, th I think there's a lot of this. Um, I, this is one of the most common things in academia. And so it's it's like there's the jargon and everyone fixates on the jargon because that's so hard to process and it seems impenetrable, blah, blah, blah. I think the the harder thing that academics do to keep us outside of the discourses is what they don't, what they purposefully silence because they're playing this game of, oh, well, I won't touch that person. Oh, I won't say that person's name. And so it's like, oh, no, the people who know, they all know what you're doing when you say this thing, when you're referencing that. It's like, okay, there's a jargon, and then there's like what's literally being left out that gives it all the context that makes it relevant. There's so many of these pieces. Like, for instance, even, even, uh, on, I'll be right back. I'm listening. Hold on. I'm grabbing okay. something. Cool. Even Land's piece that we read last week, uh, his critique of transcend transcendental miserabilism, that was a piece that originally came out straight up as a response to Fisher. And then Land erased that from the record. So Land's even playing this game. It's like, guys, you know, you, you say a critique of transcendental miserabilism, but what you mean is a critique of Mark Fisher. Now, the, the real clickbaity way to, to write that would have been, Mark Fisher's fucking wrong. Find out why. Um, or, or, oh, Mark, Mark Fisher's miserable, depressive, you know, uh, Personality all comes out of a uh, his commitment to uh, some lost causes and some antiquated concepts, and he can't get the reality pill. Whatever, come on, but make it relevant. I, you know, a good another good example of it would be like uh, I love to go to this example, Doctor Adolf Reed Jr. The color line then and now, uh, something something something. The souls of black folk. Like it's like this long uh, title to an essay of a. a, a, a Really rigorous, awesome essay. Very dry, very hard to parse, but it's it's powerful what he does in that piece. The thing is, is if he wanted to actually get people who are outsiders to go, oh, something's going on here. Then another thing he could have said was, how W. E. B. Du Bois' most conservative phase from his early life. That was historically specific to the pre the the segregation era is being kept alive today by identity hucksters. Oh, that would have been a polemic, though. You know, that would be that would get people's oh, oh, what? That's what he's doing. Instead, like somebody could research this stuff their whole life and they would just see that in passing and they'd go, I don't care. Why should they care? There's nothing in the title that says why you should care. And so that's something to be aware of underground theorists everywhere um never judge a book by its cover yeah never judge an academic article by its title because the titles have very little to do with like the real point so dave so i actually now have a copy of reza's cyclonopedia which is his first book and his great theory fiction work about the middle east and oil and it is a it's a remarkable book i i Trying to understand everything, it, it, you know, it's it's incredibly difficult. But it's if you're tapped into the CCRU, you read this and you see this as an expansion upon that work, uh, while also doing something really original with it. Here's the funny thing, though. Reza was a member of the CCRU, or, or if here's the thing, I don't know this official list. I know that there's people who oh, official member of the CCRU. I think Reza was. I know he was around with all of them doing this stuff. and But it's bizarre. So, okay, look at this. This is a uh, page 157. In Cyclonopedia, there's the fucking pneumogram. 
But guess what? No mention of land, no mention of the CCRU, no mention of those writings. And it's just there. And I'm sitting there going, and I mean, he's doing the whole new, uh, numeracy or new numerology thing. Uh, here, just real quick. Um, in both the ordinal and absolute values of traditional Kabbalah, the number seven, located at the time circuit of the pneumogram, interconnects with the number 12, which is Kabbalistically reducible to the number three. One plus two equals three. Therefore, when spelled out in its original Hebrew, number seven can be mapped according to the number three. Accordingly, then, okay, you get the point. But he just drops the pneumogram in there. And, and, and it, it's just weird how you want to go. First off, you guys have never truly explained what the fuck, how this pneumogram works. Um, look, that's mm -hmm. maybe that's a spoiler for the course. We're going to talk about the occult stuff, but there's only so much I can do because these fucks themselves never really have fully explained what they're doing with this shit. And no. yet he just throws it in there like it's it makes perfect sense or whatever. So this is a thing with them. It, it, it's bizarre, but yeah, go ahead, Dave. I just want to say anyone who heard that is going to go, wait, whoa, that's very different from the quote that I just shared. I just want everyone to, he's self, like I know Reza is aware of this. Like he says, this is, he's got his theory fiction and he's got his real theory. Just like Land does. Just like Land does. They're separate. But yeah, anyway, this, this like not naming one another, not engaging, it's really fucking weird, dude. And think about how you and I think of our history, Dave, and say for whatever reason, you say we weren't even mad at each other. We just stopped talking or something. And you and I wrote two books responding to each other and didn't name each other. I'm sorry, even if I get annoyed with you and don't talk to you for a while, I'm going to reference you when I'm talking about time energy. I mean, come the fuck on. It's vague posting at its final. Right? <laughs> it's like, why don't you do another 500 pages of vague posting for us all? You know? You know. Uh, but I think it goes all the way back. I mean, it's it's not so they're symptomatic of the actual this academics. Where they're human all too human, just to, I'm this saying. Is, this is where they're academic all too academic. This is where they're all, because academics are very sensitive people. Once they get pissed, they just, they think that the, most cruel thing that you can do is unname somebody and they fucking do it so hard. So the conspiracy of silence thing is real. There's a form of Jewish silence in it. It's a, it's a kind of priestcraft. If you want to think about it through the, yeah. the vampire castle or the, the whatever cathedral. It's like, it is, it is all those things, but it is also just like, I don't want to say it's just the fault of academic philosophy. Cause I think that, I, I just saw Nina Power and Peter Bogosian do an interview, um, and 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 Bogosian was trying to say that philosophy itself is rotten at the core, and, and that they, like he, he he's going through this death of God thing, but with philosophy, and because he was always this philosophy professor, and he's just like, how did the entire field sell out? And and she's like, no, I mean, yeah, well, it's a little different where I'm from, you know, it's not so bad. There's you know, we're on a small island. People all know each other. So it's actually kind of in England, like it's actually small enough that a lot of these things don't happen where there's a sprawl and people can just keep moving around. Um, and so she's trying to say, no, it is a problem with academic philosophy, but it's not a real problem with philosophy itself. Um, and it was funny watching him try to wrap his brain around that. Like he, he was having trouble processing it, but it's like, yep, man, uh, there is something about the actual academic structure and the 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 shredding of time energy and the uh just the workload that they're all under and then the fact that you know academics are usually like more sensitive people in general just they are um and you just bring all these factors together and it's just it becomes this sort of game where it's like judith butler's actively unnaming people every page she writes she's been actively avoiding any real conversation or dialogue or serious engagement with Joan Kopchak for 20, 20 you know, fucking years. The greatest critique of Butler ever written. It's like Joan doesn't exist. And I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I've got the book right here. It does exist. Yeah. We'll confirm. Yeah, yeah it make it stop existing. Judith. Yeah. You know, but, you know, it, 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 it's just, I'm sorry, though. It, it, intellectually speaking, it confuses the reader 
when you don't, oh, you know those guys that I spent years with doing drugs and doing Kabbalistic rituals with? Yeah, I'm not going to name them. And they, I helped write these vo this volume of theory fiction called the CCRU Writings. I was part of that. I'm not going to reference it, even though I'm going to use the pneumogram, which is from it. It's it just like... Well, and they, they rationalize it. I, will, I, I, won't, I won't speak for Reza. I don't know what he thinks about this. Who knows? Maybe I'll ask him someday, but... That would be cool. Um, well, it would be, it would be, but it's. Uh, I think that a uh, a lot of this is rationalized as it's that deplatforming logic, which is based on this idea that ideas have this viral agency outside of us, and that they can get inside of people and info oh, hazard. What, what, if yeah, land is an info hazard. So if I put them on the page, I'm doing violence to every marginalized community in existence, and it's like it. I have seen Reza say shit where it's like, it makes me think that I wouldn't be surprised if that's where he would go with it. And so it's just like, Hey, you know what? That's what you got to do. You tell yourself to sleep at night. Great. But in the meantime, this is without that rationalization of it. It's still what academics are doing without that. They don't have to be social justice warriors to still have this, to still treat people this way. So yeah. Yeah. You oh you found some way of rationalizing it as social justice, but really what you're doing is the exact opposite of the idea of the university. It's the exact opposite of a tr of a community of truth seekers trying to take their particular field and their singular experiences and bring that back with recourse to the universal, an attempt to try to understand the universal. It's just everyone's like, nah, foregone conclusion. Why fuck with it? Who cares? It's there's no point. Okay. But uh, I do think that, with all that said, Reza's idea of uh, spirit and intelligence, it is. No, uh, I really, I'm going to do a, a, a focus. It's a, great, it's, it's a great counterpoint. It's something that we have to read. I, uh, one of my big goals now is to be able to, to work through them both in a sort of diligent manner. So all of this introductory work you're doing with us is really going to give me that basis. I think so. Thank you. Yeah. Do you want me to keep reading? Um, I'll just, okay, real quick. I just want to say it is worth noting this, this thing that he, he talks about in relation to Marx, creative destruction. destruction. It is something that, uh, uh, Marx did see in capitalism. It does, you know, there is, as it creates, it destroys, um, it deterritorializes all of this and it, it, it's, it's baked into it. Now, Joseph Schumpeter, who is this guy with, Austrian school, libertarian type, he also makes a lot out of creative destruction. And so um, it's just worth noting that this is a key dynamic for land that he gets from Marx on the one hand and Schumpeter on the other. And the, the thing, of course, is that Marx would, if you were to ask Marx, okay, so are you cool with this creative process of capital destroying humans? That's what he would specifically want to fight against, whereas Marx or uh, uh, Land is eh, go go full force. Who cares? Uh, but so creative destruction, uh, though he's using it in relation to Marx, which is accurate, he uses it in, in a I don't I don't know a different headspace because uh, that which is getting destroyed uh, for for Land. It's precisely what Marx wants to see emancipated, which is us. So good to keep that in mind. Um, but I think I think that's fair. Look, I mean, I want to ask you both a question, but I'm afraid like this is one of these big ones. Um, but no, that's fine. I'm going to ask you, and then we'll read the rest and close it out. Okay. Here's the big one. Yeah. This process that that D and G and Marx see, which is this is where I see their their leftism, which is we side with whatever is going to destroy local identity, local symbolic codes, all of that. They view that as emancipation. I'm sympathetic to that. I, I see because again, if you take the jar, do I want to live in a, a a society like a traditional medieval Christian society? No, because I don't want. That whatever I, how whoever I was born to, and whatever this, I don't want to be locked into their identity system 
with all of the regulations and expectations those identities come with. I don't want that. I don't view that as freedom. And so if the, if the choice is, oh, be a capitalistic consumer or be a medieval Christian, I'll choose, a, I'll choose being a soulless capitalistic consumer 100 times out of 100 over being a medieval Christian uh, with that whole metaphysics and ontology. And so I view being a consumer in relation to the past as a freedom. And that is a, a weird thing. Most everybody on the left would just go, no, being a consumer is like the worst thing. But I think comparing, and yes, I, it's not something I want to be <laughs> for, uh, there's other futures. I would, you know, I, I think there's a whole thing to be emancipated from consumer, of course. But I, if I had to choose, I, I would take consumerism over uh, traditional Christianity, worldview, et cetera. How do you guys feel about this this idea that economics or capital becoming the primary governing principle of a society breaks apart these former worlds rooted in essentialistic qualifications? What are your view? What what's your view on this dynamic? So I think again, I think it it, I think it for me it comes back to this idea of of a realism. a realism someone's echoing somewhere um, um i th i think we should take the the realist point of view um i think obviously it has emancipated us um i think that potential is there to break down uh these old categories and obviously yeah deterritorialization um yeah, I think that's a good thing. I don't know if it's necessary. I think getting into um that's almost like getting into like a metaphysical argument, like worrying about whether it it necessarily has this potential or not. Um or if there could have ever been some other better system. I don't know. I I think um yes, deterritorialization is a good thing, but it does go hand in hand with re-territorialization and that matters more to me. And I, I think that's why, like, I love having these conversations about accelerationism, but I think left accelerationists a lot of the time miss the point. Um, I think saying there's no way out but through isn't like a mandate, but, but like a, a recognition of, conditions on the ground like yeah we are in this position right now and because of that we our mandate is to act our mandate is not to um moralize or ponder you know what ifs i i don't know i think um taking from this a realism and i keep coming back to that word but like it it really does kind of capture the idea of like yes these things are true these are conditions that are i think undeniable but that doesn't say anything about anything other than like oh we're here where we are right now now we need to act um but Wait, I, I this is what we we keep coming back to this i'm not i i'm not anti accelerationist yeah. But I'm definitely anti anti acceleration. Well, it's, <laughs> so it's it's like my position on postmodernism too. Like it's like the postmodern condition is is undeniable. But I'm not a postmodernist. You know, like the goofy loopy. Like yeah, I think the accelerated condition is undeniable. But I I wouldn't call myself an accelerationist. I've been called an accelerationist, and I have referred back to Marx to justify my apparent accelerationism. But no, I'm not an acceleration at all. Like, if anything, I'm going to slow everything down. Um, but that realism that is in a lot of these accelerationist thinkers, I think that's a necessary uh, position to, to take. Um, and I think a lot of people get it wrong. I think a lot of people do get lost in the sauce. Um, mm -hmm. And they, they want to act as if there's some kind of necessity or even like a, a telos um but even then talking about like telos they miss the point like telos is something that's always after the fact so like it doesn't matter like it's a moot fucking point at like 
we shouldn't be concerned with this because we'll only ever know at the end of the process. And oops, guess what? At the end of the process is like, we don't have access to that. Um, now you're talking like Zizek. It's the contingency of the quilting point. We don't know it before the fact. Right, but we can still kind of gain an insight from accepting that position and, and saying this is where we, we're currently situated. Um, we, need to, we need to deal with current on-the-ground conditions, not um, you know, it, virtual. Like, I, I don't know. I, I guess it is kind of a delicate position because you have to take some but you can't take all of it. Um, and I think a lot of people miss the point, which is why, again, I think these conversations are absolutely necessary because a lot of people will sit back and talk about this stuff as if it's either an information hazard and so it's cool, like, yeah, we're doing the cool thing, we're rebels, or they talk about this stuff um, like history, historiographically or... T you know, they, they do this stupid Marxist thing where they're just like, oh, yeah, you know, it's a, this is a necessary movement, blah, blah, blah. Like, <laughs> this is a it's, it's ephemeral. It's just downstream <laughs> from the material conditions. Yeah. You know, and the problem with that type of dialect dialectical logic is it's too. Objective. Now, I want to I want to use that word very specific. It's objective in the sense that it treats historical causality like physical objects between this book hit that book and knocked it over like we're talking about the causality of physical motion whereas the move towards a new mode of production would be so such a, a sprawling fabric of multi causes that there's no one direct cause that oh if a then b right yeah. And and that's what so much of worldview Marxism seems to act like the dialectic is is um, if if proletariat then proletariat revolution if proletariat revolution then communism and the, this and again it's it's like watching you know somebody set up dominoes and hit them and, and it, they just fall over and you know in, in a causal chain as if social revolution works and i just i i can't view so it'll be such a intricate tapestry of modifications and causes across media economics culture it'll be a whole thing right and um it'll be a web of causes i guess is what i'm trying to say yeah and, and we won't we won't be able to like you said there there's not one thing that we can pick or point to and say that's the one thing um or that that's the i don't know the 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 fulcrum like the one no like it it is this mass of the conditions cause, capital c right um and yeah and, and people act like it will be the it will be the case that there will be one totalizing yeah, factor I guess that's where, it, look, I, I'm, I'm caught in the middle here. I'm against treating the future in some deterministic way. The way when you read Land, this is he, he treats it this way. When you read Worldview Marxists, they treat it this way. I don't yeah. view. I don't think the world is determined. Despite I get that the, we're governed by a, a positive feedback loop here and now, and that has certain tendencies or certain you know, consequences that come out of it eventually. I can follow that logic, right? Um, and again, like if you see somebody standing on a train track and you see a train headed, you're going to try to get, help them off the train because you know where this is going, right? That's fine. But at the same time, I'm also opposed to the, I don't know, it's a kind of Hegelian position like, oh, well, the Alla Minerva only takes flight at dusk, which is to say, Philosophy can only theorize the past. It can't theorize the future. And that I also some in some way reject. And we have to traffic with the virtual future. I, I, I agree with Land on this. Do we have to treat it like it's whatever, however we're trafficking with it is fate or deter? No, basically I want a 
<laughs> Todd and Slavoj might give me shit for that. I want a synthesis, basically. I want okay. a conceptual way to say, look, we can traffic with the future. We can do hyperstition. We can fight for visions, robust visions of the future, future. while at the same time maintaining the radical contingency of it all and that it will only be necessary retroactively after the fact. There's nothing ensuring that this is going to happen, right? So yeah, basically, and then, and I, I want both positions. That's just a compatibilism. And, and I think, like, yeah, of course, that I think that is I think the it's way uncontroversial, you controversial, actually, what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah dude. Like, I, um, I don't think I'm making some bold, unique claim here i think yeah. it's just how, it sounds i think it's how shit works yeah and but okay, dave i want to know what you think about the whole thing about like emancipation is the process of ripping us freeing us from essentialist local identities because i say that to you because you had to emancipate yourself from a very rigid symbolic order you grew up in. And I, I don't know, I see that as something that you have a lot of a lot of heart for this position. I also see uh, detect that you're probably going to go, yeah, but to it on some other level. And so what's the yeah, but? Well. I wish that this was an interview where I was the subject of the interview, but because it's not, I'm going to just say this. Are you punting? I hold a mysterious third position. <laughs> Let's keep going. I really do hold a different position, but we're, I, I've got a lot of things that just need to sit on the back burner. For now, I'm here to learn. Let's just get to it. I'm here to learn. I don't know nothing. You teach. In this germinal accelerationist matrix, there's no distinction to be made between the destruction of capitalism and its intensification. The auto destruction of capitalism is why is what capitalism is. Creative destruction is the whole of it, beside only its retardations, partial compensations, or inhibitions. Capital revolutionizes itself more thoroughly than any extrinsic revolution possibly could if subsequent history has not vindicated this point beyond all question it has at least simulated such a vindication to a maddening degree i just want to say like uh i think i actually wrote this in my work at amazon book i wrote like i just don't think if communism had won that automation would look would have gotten to this point yet right like i i i think people Capital thinks more radically than humans imagine. Like that, that's, that's what I'm saying. Like you, when you're inside of a, one of these warehouses and you realize like the mass scale of, of this like automation, it's like, it's absolutely like overpowering. And it's like, I think that sh that stuff would have gone into monuments. It would have gone into big fancy domes. It would have gone into making sure everybody has bread and basic literacy, which is good. It would have gone into a bunch of things including military, because the, the military to win in the first place would have been the main thing. But it's just like this much just to make sure we get our shit fast. I don't think that would have happened. And I'm over it. I'm over acceleration. I'm over the get a new phone every year. I'm over it. But that's that's because capitalism has this planned obsolescence thing built into it. And it cares more about uh, capital accumulation than it does say, making these things useful for us, sure. But the idea is like when people look around in the 80s, someone like Gores is like looking around in the 80s or someone in the 30s like Keynes is looking around and they're going, oh my God, look how effective, look how efficient. This could basically reduce the work, the working week so significantly that we could have lives outside of our jobs. Like they're saying that looking around at their conditions then. And they're like, capitalism has surely reached its point of Self overcoming capitalism is seriously bottomed out. the 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 rate of profit cannot fall any further. There's, you know, they they're thinking we're there, and then they always make these predictions. How oh, within X amount of time, 
then things will change. And it's like, guys, you don't realize like how much further it can go. And I only say that based on what I'm seeing compared to what they were seeing where I stand now. So then I have to say like, man, that's why I go capital could go for another million years. Like I, my, my kids will probably look back at me and be like, ha ha ha, you know? So who knows? You know, I'm, I'm very agnostic on all of that, but, um, Can I, I just, I, while you're on this thought, I want to ask you this though. Look, because I see what you're saying, Nance, but if, if I have no problem saying I'm some kind of left accelerationist for this specific reason here, right here. I don't think we get anything like the universal emancipation of time energy without some sort of accelerating the process of automation, which is tied up with capital. And so that is where I, I, the whole thing is. I don't think we get time energy without a greater development of automated technology. And so if that's the case, accelerate the process from my perspective. Um, we don't have enough technology unless we have enough to free us from wage labor. And I don't know if at this specific moment, I know that we could have shorter work weeks right now. Is it enough to give us time energy the way that we want it? I don't think it is. And so if that's the case, I'm on the side of whatever gets us to the point that we're free from time energy. And I think that's where I'm I have to be an accelerationist because I I have to believe the only way we get there is through greater technological acceleration. I think I appreciate that point. And I, I think I agree with it like 98%. I think I, I get wary when it comes to making any prescriptive statements. And, and that's probably like a lazy way to think. Like I probably could get myself to where I, I would say definitely no. Um, but I, here's the thing, as I'm working towards writing my book, part of it is if you're going to write a book and you're going to try to make a theoretical contribution, you have to choose some positions. Yeah. And other because I, I've read theory books before that really don't have any position. The, the, the writer has no position at all. It's a weird kind mm -hmm. of just kind of talking about aspects of theory without. And it's like, no. Here's one thing I appreciate Lan about Land. He makes bold fucking claims about his position. And I appreciate that about Land. I appreciate it about D&G. I appreciate it about Zizek. I appreciate it about Gores. Yeah, Gores, exactly. And so my thing is, even if your positions end up being flawed, which they are going to be, right? I don't care who you are. You're going to have flaws in your theory. It's still... Making bold claims lead to bold counterclaims. Reza responding to Nick. And so I think we have to risk looking like fools eventually because we didn't think something out or whatever. But if we make bold claims and younger thinkers can take those bold claims and think them and then respond to them or either take them and develop them further or take them and critique them and show why they're faulty in – fuck individual reputation mm -hmm. that is how we as a species move along and so that's where i'm I'm like no there i'm just gonna say it there's some part of me that's a left accelerationist because i i want universal time energy and i think the demand for universal time energy makes me have to be some sort of an accelerationist right that's so just we're about to release the on on theory underground the full uh, exegetical reading nance and i did on the uh farewell to the working class by andre gores and we get into this stuff a little bit there but basically we need heteronomy heteronomous labor will exist the realm of heteronomy will never go away, even in a society that's mostly automated. But acceleration minus a sophisticated development of necessary um, concepts that radicalize people to, to, a, to a reprioritization of their values um, 
will just be Mad Max World. Um, but there's there that's why they're the, we're doing the most important work in the world. And you know, people can fucking cure cancer or you know, find a new planet. I don't give a shit. Uh this mechanization solving the problems of mechanization thing is never going to work without the development of concepts that actually get at something and uh, necessarily reorient people's value systems. So I, I, there, is a, there is a thing that people do when they burn out on politics where they turn to spiritual stuff or, oh, what we need is a value shift, right? They're, they're done with politics and they're just interested in, I hate it, but I also think there's something to it. And I think we can have our cake and eat it too. And that's because we're philosophers and that's, this is actually our domain. And those people are usually tapping out of philosophy before that it was a foregone conclusion. That's why they were into politics in the first place. They didn't, they didn't think philosophy had anything to offer. And now, now that they're post politics, they still don't turn to philosophy. They go play video games and pray to God or whatever it is, but they're not interested in really. Yeah. What, what we're talking about. So a concept like time energies, I don't want to say it's constructed or designed because to you know to a certain degree it's not it's an actual it's an experience articulated, but it's also meant to, in the way it is articulated, force people to go to have this confrontation with a kind of lack they have in their life they did not realize, and stoke a kind of desire that was burning out, and in doing so, their value system reorients. Right, because they go, you know what? This weekend thing is bullshit. It's not enough time to actually do anything. I can't learn languages. I've been trying my whole life and failing because I don't have the time energy when I thought I did. Right. And because now they have a word for it. And so it's like, we can keep doing that. That is our job. It's our specialty. It's our skill. It's our trade. It's our whatever. It's it's what we're specializing in. Um which is kind of a crazy thing to say because we're also generalists. But that one aspect of the thing is like, yeah, that's why it's, th th that's why it's it's it still holds true to the, this basic idea of critical theory. It is interpretation so as to change things in some way, you know. Well, and it's it's funny. Yeah. So yesterday, um, I went out with a, some friends, a mutual friend of ours, and I was talking to a girl I just met, and. Uh, She's real into uh, political theory, but it became it, it, throughout the course of the conversation, it was clear that she doesn't have a lot of sympathy for communism or socialism. And so I was like, okay, let me let me do the thing. So instead of talking use, using the words, I started talking about time energy, wholeheartedly on board, wholeheartedly on board with a society. She hates work. She uh, she understands that work is a time suck and it prevents us from doing the things we're passionate about and we can't build the type of relation. She knows the whole thing she feels and not just intellectually, but in the core of her fucking being, she I could tell she felt it. So just shifting out of the historical baggage of these words and talking about it in a different way, using a different theoretical apparatus. Somebody who doesn't want anything to do with hammers and sickles or red and yellow or anything like that totally wants everything to do with time energy. And so, again, I, I agree. We've said this kind of thing, too. But I have to also just say I want nothing to do with the red and yellow hammer and sickle. And I'm not just saying strategically like one time when we did our first live stream that and and I was like, man, you're talking like we're having a secret conversation. We're on a platform right now that my audience is not yeah, left. You're asking, do I want to live in the Soviet Union? The answer is no. Yeah. Yeah. Not only is it no, but I'm not masking communism as something else. Hmm. I'm not. We're talking about I'm not a communist. I am not a communist. I'm not a capitalist. I am against both. I don't think that left versus right is a real like thing. I think it's all bullshit. Yeah. This is um, how you get to people, especially in America, is by getting outside of these, right. these term circuits. I, it just – because 
because I think that there's there is a way of of doing this where and I've seen like just you know standard worldview Marxists uh, do it where they they kind of say what you just said, but they have a different meaning entirely. They're saying, oh yeah, instead of dictatorship of the proletariat, we'll call it a uh, worker democracy. Instead of calling it um, the the this that and the other, we'll call it this this and this. No, and it's I like, don't think the old answers are our answers. You're copy pasting, and then you're just changing words now. No, yeah. this is get rid of the copy pasting. We can still learn from their mistakes, their successes. We can still learn, from, but guess what? You can do that with capitalism too. So anyway, um, and I like Catron for that reason because he's he's he is, he definitely believes that there's a there is something bourgeois to be sublated. You know what I mean? No, but I'm saying before, when it comes to talking to normies, this is where the the rhetorical power of it is found where some sort of an emancipatory vision of time energy that's a type of vision they can get behind whereas you start doing the traditional leftist visions of emancipation they're not they don't they won't even hear it no no well cuz it, and it's not just because of the propaganda it's because these it, the moment you start doing this, you reveal how out of touch you actually are. So, you know, it's, people have a basic sense for their possibilities. Yeah. yeah. And they, they get that that's not one of them. Can I just, so, I, I don't know if I quoted this. I just want to say this kind of goes back to what you said a minute ago. Um, now I'm kind of losing the thread, but I'm going to quote, quote it anyway, real quick. This is a young CCRU Mark Fisher saying, Marx has been outdated by cybernetic theory. It's obvious that capitalism isn't going to be brought down by its contradictions. Nothing ever died of contradictions. Now, I think that those are Land's words coming out of a young CCRU Fisher's mouth, right? Because he said this when he was still a member of the CCRU. But it, this is the, the, the challenge here, which is to say, can we rely on the built-in contradictions of capital to bring it down because this is where this confrontation with land is so important because the confrontation with land from like a marxist perspective would be land is saying capital is primarily a positive feedback loop which means it's going to overcome any of its own inherent contradictions which means it's going to preserve its amplification process it's augmentation process. It's not going to structurally fall apart because the overarching process of MCM uh, prime, MCM prime is so powerful, so intense that whatever little built in, oh, there's a contradiction between use value and exchange value. Use values want to be used, but exchange values prevent the use value from being used. So we have lots of houses that are built ready to be used by people, but the exchange values and the bank's ownership and all of that gets in the way from people occupying and using the house. Do we think that's going to bring the system crumbling down? I, I, this is this big question that land brings us to, to theorize. Do these structural contradictions in capital, are they enough to bring it down? Or will it just go on living with its own contradictions, just like we do with our death drive and our, our inherent contradictions at the subjective level? We still keep going. We get out of bed. We do what we do, even though we're contradictory. I, I think that because we're all uh, Zizekian pilled to a certain degree on this contradictions thing, the point is that those contradictions are constitutive and productive. And so capitalism is not a thing. That's the other thing. People are constantly making it into a thing. It's not a thing. It's a process. And as a process, it is a process that, that has constituent contradictions. But they're literally – I mean that's – yeah, so, so, so does the, uh, the, the, the acorn that becomes a tree. It has constituent contradictions, but that's a process of growth. This has nothing to – so that people are like, oh, these contradictions are going to lead to failure. I don't give a fuck. Come on. Stop it. But also, I mean, I'm still – But there's one – then there's one I'm also, sympathetic towards. I'm also – well, Ted Reese is is awesome for you know 
the tendency for the rate of profit to fall and actually what the implications of that really are in underground theory. He goes, or into we it. automate to the point that there are no employees getting wages. Who the fuck buys the shit that the capitalists are selling us? There's that contract. And I mean, I get, I'm just saying like that, like every one of the 17 contradictions that David Harvey talks about is somehow truly a threat to the, yeah. the continuance of the system. That's up for debate. I think at this point, so, all right, you want to finish this out here? I'll, I'll read this paragraph, and then I'm going to step away for a brief second while I'm still listening. Um, but this is like one of my favorite paragraphs. Yeah. And he, actually, he actually uses people's names here. Check it out. Mm -hmm. In 2015, Nick Cernichek and Alex Williams sought to resolve this intolerable, even schizophrenic ambivalence in their manifesto for an accelerationist politics, which aimed to precipitate a specifically anti-capitalist left accelerationism clearly demarcated over against its abominably pro-capitalist right accelerationist shadow. Um, can you scroll up slightly there, Nance, for a second? I do want to see what is, so creative destruction. Uh, is that all we're talking about? We're just talking, if subsequent history has not vindicated this point beyond all question, it has at least simulated such a vindication to a maddening degree. The point just being the capital is more revolutionary than any actual revolution. That's okay. So he's saying that, uh, so for Alex Williams and Nick Cernicek, that's an, that's an intolerable, um, situation. And so they have this ambivalence, um, for it. Is that right? So this project predictably was more successful. Sorry, no. Where's the end of that last sentence? Is that it? Anti clearly demarcated over against this abominably pro capitalist right acceleration shadow. Okay. This project predictably was more successful at reanimating the accelerationist question than an ideologically pure than at ideologically purifying it in any sustainable way. It was only by introducing a wholly artificial distinction between capitalism and modernistic technological acceleration that their boundary lines could be drawn at all. The implicit call was for a new Leninism without the new economic policy and with the utopian techno-managerial experiments of Chilean communism drawn upon for illustration, which is kind of where left accelerationism tends to build its little fort right well, see, and that's i mean but that's kind of the heart we talked about it last time can we think the emancipation of technological development from capital accumulation land's position is and we said it last week he's got history on his side he's got empirical data on his side the driving force of technological development has been capital accumulation for him you can't separate them to lose capital accumulation is to lose radical technological development i th i think i can speak for us where i i think we want the the radical technological development without capital accumulation wage labor exploitation etc and so the task for us and this is again this is kind of the this is the task of less accelerationism if it's going to really continue to be anything is how do we think bifurcating this thing how do we shed capital but keep the technological development going and i'm not saying like oh we have to it would happen now it's not going to happen now but we have to actually think this and it not presuppose it as some magical event it'll just happen it won't just happen we have to how can this fucking happen when they've been interconnected from the inception of capital now Obviously, somebody can go, well, humans made shit. They were technological before cap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything that we know of as technology in, in the modern sense, we do in some way owe to capital accumulation. Of course, human creativity was at the heart of it. Um, human cooperation and collaboration was part of it. We're not denying that. But the economic facilitator of our creativity has been capital and this is what marx and dng they have no problem giving the devil his due here 
and I guess I don't either in the in this sense. The point is, I want the devil to die, <laughs> um, and well, I, and yeah, I want to maintain the, uh, the the liberatory dimension of tech. And so, yeah, reading, the question is how to do that. Reading Gore's, I think for me, it was the first time I came across someone preparing to deal with that. Um, being realistic. Now, of course, I love science fiction, and I love both like dystopian cyberpunk science fiction. I also love utopian. I love Star Trek. I love Peter F. Hamilton's Commonwealth. Like I, I, did, I love science fiction because it, it talks about the world and what's happening right now, but it projects it into the future. And a lot of it is speculative fiction and, and I like it. Um, but most of the time people talk about the future, they're doing it in this purely like fictional sense, like it, it, like Gore's really did feel like the first person, um, to, and he wasn't even talking about the far future. He wasn't like he wasn't doing theory fiction. He's very much talking about like on the ground shit. Um, but his idea of freeing up people to explore autonomous activity. Um, I don't know, just, it, it felt like the first time somebody was really thinking about, can we separate technology, capital T from, from capital or from economics or whatever? And I think, yeah, I think we can, like, I obviously, um, that's where I kind of come down on, on like this hope for future, for a human future, for emancipation, blah, blah, blah. I think it can be separated, but I, I really do think we need to figure out a lot of the nitty gritty shit because necessarily technology is so, well, it's, it's, it's been tailorized. Like, yeah, it, shit, it's mined in Africa and then it's fucking shipped over to China and Malaysia and shit to be fabricated and then it's shipped over to somewhere in Eastern Europe to be put together and then it's shipped over here to America like it's it is such a global enterprise um that we can't have some anarcho primitivist future utopia like we we have to have a real um a realistic economic machine um uh, but I think it can be done or at least I hope it can be done. The thing is, though, again, and because, I mean, Land was fully aware that this was, I mean, I guess he'd call it the dream of so socialist revolution. We were seeing it last week in Critique of Transcendental Miserabilism, which is the, 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 the socialist slash communist position was always, no, you want technological revolution. Let's liberate the means of production and the forces of production from capitalist social relationships which is to say let's overthrow the class dynamic and um have collective ownership of the means of production and you're really going to see what the fuck technology can do um the the issue is that land can just go to history and go yeah that's great uh he can do the that's nice on paper thing but in reality what's been the revolutionary agent is capital. And like Dave, it was like you're talking about in the Amazon uh, automated warehouse where, yeah, you have guys who can, who are specialists and they help put together and assemble this whole process, right? But what you're glimpsing, and this is what it takes a philosopher, I think, to glimpse this kind of stuff. What you're glimpsing is no one person has mastered or controlled this whole thing. It's you're getting a glimpse of how capital is a kind of autonomous intelligence unto itself. I'm not saying it's artificial intelligence yet in the it's it's not conscious, but it is a kind of sprawling virtual intelligence unto itself, which isn't reducible to any single human mind that is identical to it. And because this intelligence system, is trans individual it means that it really has a kind of life of its own and that's where you can see this what if that 
what you're already perceiving becomes conscious of itself. That's when Land talks about, oh, accelerationism is getting to know itself better. What's the actual line from the top here? Uh, he says, I think it's on the first page. Where does he say it? That's the nature of things. It was already caught up with trends that seemed too fast to track when it began to become self-aware decades ago. It has picked up a lot of speed since then. Yeah, and I thought somewhere he says like it's getting to know itself. Yeah, he. Better. Yeah, there is a. Maybe I. I don't know. No, but, it's, um, it's there. It's in there, right? Yeah. Time pressure typically. Weird. I felt like we read it. The the quote I have in mind. Maybe it's further down. It could be. Because there, yeah, there there is a better, better quote when he's talking about this self awareness. Yeah, where he says, "Acceleration. All it's getting, it's getting to know itself. Where it's." Well, somehow, I'm just not finding it. Wait, what are you looking for? There's a quote where he's talking about the process of accelerationism. Um, what it's getting, what it's doing is getting to know itself better. Hmm. And I've read so much land. I'm like, did did one of you read it today, or did I read it earlier somewhere? It's like all blurring together. I, I thought it was in this piece, but it, it, I mean, it might be in a different uh, one. But I was pretty sure it's in this one. While you look for it, I want to say something. Uh, I want to go back to what Dance was talking about with Gore's and Gore's feeling like the first person who's talking about the future, and it doesn't just I like. Of course, there are sci-fi authors who make the future like this real robust thing, right? But generally, philosophers and political philosophers are not thinking about the future in this like in this way. And it's just like to me, it's the difference between possible and plausible. Like it has to have a certain degree of rhetorical, practical, and p potentially even ontological uh, significance when you say that. So I don't know. I just think plausibility, like I don't know. In in uh, in modal logic, you think about the necessary, the possible, the not possible, the contingent, right? I got that at an introductory level. Maybe there's higher reaches of it where they, maybe there's some great thinker who really does think plausibility in like an existential sense and like develops some like logic for thinking about it. But right now, I don't think it exists. I don't know. Like pl plausibility is. Why you practice, why you experiment, why you do things, right? Uh -huh. we're, we're, we're not just interested in what's possible, right? We're, we're not just, oh, we like this idea, this thing sounds good, it's in a, some platitudinous way, and then we project it forward. No, we're also like feeling out the situation that has real boundaries, have real borders. And uh, like there's some things... Like there's a, there's a lot of things that are not necessary. They are contingent. They could be changed to some degree. They're constructed, but how plausible is it that those things can be changed within some period of time without that being the focus? Actually, renders other projects impossible. Mm -hmm. Like this is plausibility being okay. added to the calculus, and so I don't know. It's something I want to dive a lot deeper into, but. 
I think Gorse and I think that, you know, another example would be Peter Phrases for Futures. The introduction he writes is a really awesome, awesome piece on its own. And it's a defense of thinking about the future in, in a rigorous and, uh, uh, you know, a, a methodological way, you know. Um, and of course, we have to do some kind of epistemology about such things as well, eventually. But for right now, it's just even getting getting the conversation going because for this for this no for this human futures volume, right? Like, I think we've, we've got to have a basis in a few thinkers who think about the future in a very serious way, which is why ultimately we are reading Nick Land is because he's shaped by how he's thinking about the future, right? That's so it's like if if Kant had thought this much about the future, then we'd be reading Kant right now, right? right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I found a quote that'll it serves the same function as the one I'm thinking of, so it doesn't matter. So we can keep going. Um, we'll get to the point as we finish this out. Okay. Capital, in its ultimate self-definition, is nothing beside the abstract, accelerative social factor. Its positive cybernetic schema exhausts it. Runaway consumes its identity. Every other determination is shucked off as an accident at some stage of its intensification process. Since anything able to consistently feed socio-historical acceleration will necessarily, or by essence, B capital, the prospect of any unambiguously left accelerationism gaining serious momentum can be confidently dismissed. Accelerationism is simply the self-awareness of capitalism, which has scarcely begun. We haven't seen anything yet. That, that was the trick. Yeah. That, that, don't, you, Jay, don't you feel like it's some, some, this is, we got to kind of be... Let's not be philosophers in the kind of Christian paranormalistic sense here. Let's allow ourselves a little bit of a sci-fi speculative fun. This is type of virtual process that you see occurring with Amazon's automation. Don't you feel like it's an almost process that can very, very easily become aware of itself? Or, or in some sense, already is our work on refining itself, using us to build itself. As if, and this is what I think Land is trying to, he, 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 he glimpses something like this. When you see these complex processes that are basically, he calls them convergent waves, which he, is a scientific term, but it's this process of taking a whole multitude of things and pulling them together into a kind of functional unit, right? You see this ever accelerating process of greater efficiency as if something is pulling it all together and it's not one person or that person or a little group of people. It's like there's something bigger at work that's trans individual pulling this process together. Right, right. Well, now that I've seen transcendence, you know, I, you know, I believe it. I, I see how, I see, I've seen it happen. I've witnessed this possible future, and it's, and that's what this is it the concrete. Plausible. What you're having is the concrete Landian experience of how the future is bringing itself into existence. That's what he means. Mm. It's not the crazy scenario of literal time travel. This kind of Positive, you're, you you got a phenomenological glimpse of a, a big, large-scale positive feedback loop. And you got a, a, a hint of what its end goal is, what its telos is. You know what it is. It's greater efficiency in productivity. But this is why he loves that example from Terminator 2 at the very end, where the T-1000, they've frozen it in... What is it? Uh, uh, is it liquid carbon? What What is it? Liquid nitrogen. Nitrogen, yeah. They, they've frozen it. 
and it's it's the it's the liquid metal terminator and they frozen it and then they broke it into you know 10,000 pieces but the point is it starts it, it's by some fire and so it starts to melt and then what happens is it pulls itself back together now the point is if it didn't have this future end goal all of those parts would it be pulling themselves towards that that final cause right that is how land views the emergence of the singularity is that for the last what 300 400 years of capitalism it's like this final end goal pulling itself together out of all these various parts um using us in the process like the t1000 at the end of terminator 2 and so that's the visual he uh he he provides for us to try to get a grasp on this positive feedback process. I still haven't seen Terminator Two, and actually, well, it's uh, not a spoiler. I didn't really, which you have to go watch. I, right? watch it. I was gonna watch it like today. I really was gonna watch it like this. It's week. one of the great, like the other ones. Look, I Looper. So disappointed. I know exactly. I I feel the same way. It's like you tell me you didn't see Back to the Future or Star Wars. It's like you just fuck. You, 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 the society has failed. I saw, you. I saw Back to the Future for the first time, but uh, you haven't this year. watched number three yet. I still have. I have a lot of homework to do. There's mm -hmm. a lot have of things. I've part seen. two, part two is the spooky one. Without, yeah. I mean, it, I mean, there's some. It's cool. That Biff cool. is basically Trump. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. It's it's hyperstitional. Yeah, for sure. Um, point is though, Dave, you're gonna. I mean, Terminator Two is it's one of my favorite movies ever. I I just I love it. I love it more than the first one. Yep. Um, it it's one of the greatest action movies ever made. It's like up there with uh, if you want like the in my opinion like the great action films, watch Terminator Two and watch Aliens plural. Mm. The, 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 yeah. All of them. Um. Uh, but no, I, it, it's not a spoiler. That that image is just his go-to uh, cinematic instance of a convergent wave, as he likes to call it. Cool. And also, I'm fine with spoilers. I, I'm not. I'm not like a person who. Yeah, but some of them really do. I, I know. But I, there's people who don't want to hear a fucking. Hold on. No, but for real, I want to get. I want to get in here. I just want everyone to know. I don't care about spoilers, so don't do. Don't. But also, if you're just being an asshole, spoiling things on purpose, like you know, I'm about to go see a movie like that day, or, and you're doing it on purpose. Yeah, if somebody yeah. like tells you the twist ending to ruin it, they're yeah. an asshole. But like to tell someone the plot and to tell them a, a Look, cool man, part. The good guys win. I just ruined every fucking movie for you. The good guys fucking win. Except in the Terminator <laughs> series, Skynet always comes back. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's fucking thanos it's yeah. inevitable yeah you yeah. know we're over here trying to be iron man i am iron man <laughs> but uh fucking uh all right finish this thing out all right at the time of writing left accelerationism appears to have deconstructed itself back into traditional socialist politics and the accelerationist torch has passed to a new generation of brilliant young thinkers advancing on and unconditional accelerationism. Neither right accelerationism or left accelerationism, but unconditional accelerationism. And I have a point on that, but we'll keep going. Their online identities, if not in any easily extricable way, their ideas can be searched out through the peculiar social media hashtag, hashtag RET Twitter. As blockchains, drone logistics, nanotechnology, quantum computing, computational genomics, and virtual reality flood in, drenched in ever higher densities of artificial intelligence, accelerationism won't be going anywhere unless ever deeper into itself. To be rushed by the phenomenon to the point of terminal institutional paralysis is the phenomenon, naturally, which is to say completely inevitably, the human species will define this ultimate terrestrial event as a problem. To see it is already to say, we have to do something. To which accelerationism can only respond, you're finally saying that now? Perhaps we ought to get started. And its colder variants, which are those that went out, it tends to laugh. Dun, dun, dun. You ain't gonna do shit. 
game's already the capital already won the game. The singularity's already won the game. Too little, too late. And uh, it was over before you knew it even started. I think, and that's exactly what capital would want us to think. Yeah, there there are infinite yeah, ways. Yeah. There are infinite ways to get to the inevitable, and yeah. I think. I mean, I would just say the inevitable is always something that locks into place after the fact. And, and that's that's, the, that's like, fucking that's it, man. Like it, like this this contingency, this necessary contingency. Like I like I do think. I think it makes sense to think teleologically but telos only works retrospectively and yeah, that, like, that's the, the thing. thing is land hates hegel but he's more hegelian <laughs> yeah. in the traditional yeah. textbook reading hegel yeah than Zizek is yeah because he's doing this teleology thing again we're not making this up look in uh this is and at some point it would be badass for us to just focus on this text for a while down the road because there's a lot of cool texts in here to uh, to engage with. Um, but no, this whole thing with teleology, where is it? Is that really? Uh, no, see, okay. Is, Land, Land, is, I'll, I'll say is what? That is that really Nick Land in Bolivia, circa 1997? Dressed oh. up as a <laughs> clown. It's on the internet, man. You have to believe. That has to be a joke. You have to believe That's everything you see on the internet. Yeah. That's the rules right, of so the well, internet. <laughs> so we've talked before. Timplexity is Land's term for this cybernetic temporality, this circular, uh, augmentative. For, uh, amplifying form of temporality Time he loops. also in accelerate reader it's he also calls it template uh, teleoplexy yep. so there is this teleological dimension to it again i don't this like if i had a chance to just talk pure philosophy with him i'd go how much are you an aristotelian for real because i don't think he wants to be any kind of traditional aristotelian but he and he doesn't use the term final cause, um, at least not that I, but he's talking in teleological terms, right? And the fact that he calls this cybernetic amplifying process of time, tele, uh, teleoplexy, telos is on his mind when it comes to how he thinks about this stuff. And again, it's, it's the whole thing of you have an acorn, uh, you plant it. You put it under the right, you're going to get a fucking tree, right? Like that's the final cause. And again, we don't have to do final cause in the way that we do like a metaphysical version of it. I know that that's the Aristotelian thing and modern science hates it because there's other ways, like final cause is like, what's, what's its universal purpose? It's like, hey, we're not, <laughs> it's not so much of trying to define its universal metaphysical purpose so much as just saying what does these what what do these cybernetic, cybernetic uh, feedback loops what is their end goal or something something like that which is a more materialistic type of teleology um but yeah it's just it's just worth noting that Zizek is the thinker of radical dialectical contingency whereas land while hating Hegel is more of like a cybernetic determinist. Yeah. Or necess necessityist, which I know that's, but, uh, but that, that I th it's bizarre how, how it twists around on that. That is why he fails because he just assumes the necessary outcome. And so he goes like whole hog on, on this, on the Terminator. Uh, well, and the point is, right, like, the thing is, I get how you can do that where, look, if you if you familiarize yourself with how thermostats work, you can talk about what the goal or the telos of the thermostat is, right? It, it's If you set it at 72, the goal of it is to maintain 72 in the house. And this loop that it goes through to achieve that is geared towards that end goal, that final cause. Fine. 
the global system of capital, it, 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 somebody can fairly object. So this system of economic wealth production, it's 72 degree temperature in goal for itself is actually the emergence of super. I see how somebody could go, wait, oh, what? what? I th- how do you get there? But yeah. And I th- like, I, that's that's what I, why I get so fucking frustrated, and I think in on one hand, I think what Land is doing is brilliant and and necessary, but also I think he's a fucking moron because he gets locked into thinking that we're stuck inside this thermostat, um, and that this thermostat has the the goal. I like I think we are we are in this thermostat. We are in this thermostat. I think the the thermostat's goal is not to produce super intelligence i think it is to turn the universe into nothing but paper clips but i also don't think it's deterministic yeah i also don't think it's it's deterministic like i i do think we can create wiggle room um and that's the most frustrating thing about land because he just he just he's like oh no it's necessarily this is the outcome so two things i want to add to that one Okay, so to support what land or uh, land's position on this, to to read it out loud, which is what Nance was just referencing, this is the opening sentence from his most famous essay, Meltdown. The story goes like this: Earth is captured by a techno capital singularity as Renaissance rationalization and oceanic navigation lock in to commoditization take off. Now, there's so much, like, this is where these are almost like scriptures, where you could just write, like, yeah, at some point I might actually write a line-by-line commentary on Meltdown or one of these. But here's the point. What he's trying to say is, from the very beginning of the takeoff of industrial capitalism with its commodity production system, right, which was, you know, this global economy uh, was made possible by certain basic technological innovations. So one, Renaissance rationalization, which is to say a type of rational planning in how we should organize things. You've got the mathematics, you've got all of this kind of, this this shift from religious thinking to a kind of detached, objective, problem solving, instrumental, I mean, Frankfurt School would call it, instrumental reason i think heidegger we could say we're talking about in framing in a sense right this type of thinking that is instrumental uh constantly pursuing efficiency right that locked into place um and oceanic navigation so there was technological developments that made oceanic navigation possible we were able to navigate the seas with much greater reliability and efficiency based on the the innovations of certain navigational tools, okay? And all of this coalesced into industrial capital and commodity takeoff. Here's the point. Before all that, what did he say? The earth is captured by a techno-capital singularity. He's saying the singularity, the super intelligence is already there at the very beginning when commoditization, when economic rationality, when oceanic navigation the second those come together we already have the singularity now not literally but it's there virtually as this process of mcm prime takes hold that as a virtual potential in the delusian sense the the techno capital singularities already encircled the whole planet 400 years ago and so that's that what the other thing I was going to say is, um, oh damn it! So there was that thread, and then what was the other thread? Um, said something else, Nance. Um, damn it! What was it? It's not going to come back. Well, <laughs> it's over there, here, dude. It'll come up. Right. I'm just petting Ryan and thinking about how we better close it out soon because I got to get up super early. Yeah, uh, 
Uh, it's October. It's Saturday. You know what that nope. means? I want to watch a horror movie. Mm. I'm going to go watch Trip Game 2. For real. Good. Right. All right. All right. I'm going to go night, watch Soylent Green. Oh, nice. That's a good one. Yeah. I can't, I've got a couple options. I'm, I'm, I'm way, I, I actually, like I told you guys, I picked up one hour photo. I'll have to get frailty tomorrow. They've got it on hold. I might watch one hour photo. It's not really a horror film, but it's, it's so good. And I haven't seen it in a while. I might go with that one. The other one uh, that I found, I don't, I think they had it marked wrong because it was seven bucks, but it's the Arrow video blu-ray collection of the one miscalled uh yeah one one miscall so uh films it's like a trilogy yeah i've always heard about it and haven't seen it but it's it's a famous either. i think it's japanese horror hell yeah so i I've, I've always wanted to check out this trilogy so but awesome. i think one hour photo is going to win out tonight <laughs> yeah it's a good movie dude all right awesome good talk guys all right have a good night. Later. Peace.